My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Untold Tales of Spider-Man 1996 annual, I guess pretty much the first uh, Mike Allred artwork in Marvel Comics. First, Jimmy, what do you have? Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Live. Uh, we're doing superhero comics here today. This is my superhero comic, Homeless uh, Ninja on a Skateboard, available wherever comics are sold, published by Image. So get it at a comic shop, get it at a bookstore, buy it online, wherever you can find it. Also makes a great gift this holiday season. There's about eight or nine complete stories in here. You can also join me on patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. You can see a bunch of my original art from Street Angel, as well as my other comics like Octobriana and Plain Janes. You can see the process of how I make the comics I make, basically cartoonist kayfabe, focusing on my own work and my own comics. So join me on patreon.com slash jimrug. Red Room, the antisocial network, hitting the stands uh, November 9th. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game of Red Room. And this book collection is where the four issues of the antisocial network miniseries are being warehoused from this point forward. If you got the issues, good for you, man. But uh, if you didn't, scoop up the collection. Drew tons of extra artwork <laughs> to go along with the collection. Spent the summer building this thing into an actual proper book and uh, has about 70 pages of extra stuff including these rough first drafts of the comic we're going to do a big video on this when the time comes you can also pre-order the uh, next round of red room comics called trigger warnings uh, beginning in december and i'm serializing all that material on my patreon right now all those links are in my link tree in the description below this video uh so we're looking at Untold Tales, Spider-Man, 1996, man. That Untold Tales of Spider-Man comic was uh, was a budget title. 99 cents, man, when all the other comics were two bucks, $2.50. Uh, the implication of budget titles and stuff like video games or whatever, it's like, you know, you get Qbert or something for cheap, man. It, 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 there's a, 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 a sort of diminished value of having, like, budget titles. This was not only an exception... Probably the best comic Marvel put out at that point in time. Right. And look at the date, 96. This is a time when comics are struggling. And uh, besides being a budget-friendly comic, I think each issue was self-contained. Yeah. Um, you know, it was sort of old school, but it looked really good. Uh, easy to read. Could be sold to anyone. You know, I don't know if it was marketed as all ages, but it was... It was classic comics, really. Uh, Kurt Busiak, I think, writing most of them. All of them. Um, you know, a guy who obviously is into comics history and these classic characters, and they were just fun superhero comics this at is, a time when there weren't a lot of fun superhero comics. Grab this one off the racks, man. Uh, I had Madman on my pull list, uh, the Dark Horse comic, so it was a big deal. You remember that like little weekly... What was it called? Comic Bulletin or something? Comic Shop News? Comic Shop News, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was a big deal. When All Red was going to do a little cup of coffee, man, at Marvel on this. And made sure to scoop it up. Very glad I did. Joe sent it on inks. That's an amazing team, too. Like, imagine your first comic job being Spider-Man with Joe Sinnott inking you. Absolutely, man. They were setting him up for success. This is Chris Jericho interrupting The Rock on his first <laughs> WWE appearance. You know what I mean? Like, they were really... Uh, what a great opportunity. Really captures a kind of a John Romita vibe mm -hmm. with, the, with the finishes on the work. Uh, one of the things I love, there are several things I love about... Can I give a little context to All Red coming to Marvel? Sure, yeah. This didn't happen. The lines between alternative comics or indie comics, right. it was so rare that a guy who was successful in the indie or alternative comics would do a Marvel book. Like, stylistically, usually they were just too far apart. It just didn't happen. Now it's very common. But back then it wasn't, and this was such a kind of like paradigm shift that like Mike Allred's doing Spider-Man? It was huge because it defied how to draw comics the Marvel way. You know, he's a sublime figure artist, but not known for a Kirby-like dynamics, really. Closer to like a Ditko uh, sort of energy or, you know, Alex Toth kind of energy. Heck of a figure artist. You never see him draw the same pose twice. The character's always contorted. That's in Mad Men, too. There's not, like, ever a shot where you just see Mad Men from straight point of view. The character's always bent and 
moving in an interesting way with this Spider-Man comic. Great faces and expressions. Probably one of the only uh, people to really focus on that stuff at this time. There was that uh, Justice League guy who would who would do it. Name's escaping me right Kevin now. Kevin McGuire. Yeah, Kevin McGuire. Uh, you see great gestures and uh, expressions. Like, you know what that means right there, man. <laughs> uh, pulling out the Dutch angles in almost every panel, which is perfect for a Spider-Man comic, especially when he's bouncing around the city and hopping from building to building. Love this splash page. And, you know, you get Joe Sinnott's title credit here. I think of Fantastic Four when I first think of, you know, whatever with him. Uh, that's a great Reed Richards, man. Yeah. Another thing that wasn't uh, always obvious in Fantastic Four comics of the 90s. That's true, man. Like, you, they would talk about this being uh, the world's greatest comic magazine. It's like, I'm seeing no evidence of it. What we're missing here is Laura Allred on colors. Uh, frequently, that's the colorist for Mike Allred. And so when I went back, I had not read, I did not know this comic mm -hmm. until this week. So that was a little bit surprising to me. Um, but again, like, this is his first foray into Marvel um, they're cautious, you know, they didn't work with a lot of these, uh, alternative type cartoonists. Yeah, man. You know, he was, I mean, Allred's a cartoonist, like he can ink his own stuff. They didn't, they didn't, uh, give him that grace. I'm sure he's not complaining to have no. Joe Sinnott with that super sharp, turn it, turn it to a Charles Burns. It really, man, there's some great inking. Like I, all of these sort of lines, I think he's inking those on a straight edge. Oh they're, yeah, yeah, They're yeah. perfect. Listen to Frank Miller, man, on that Dark Knight, uh, that Dark Knight documentary where he says, it takes you two years to learn to ink with a brush and a ruler. And when you do, your staircases are better. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say like, when you finally master it, you never do it again. Like use pens or something. <laughs> This roots it in time. That's the truth. I love the Sue Storm too, like a really great face. He had Joe in All Red, who I assume is patterned after Laura, um, but his women's faces were just different than everybody else drew women's faces at Marvel, DC, and you know superhero comics at the time. Kurt Busiek's conceit of this comic is that it happens in in canon, uh, corresponding with like the Steve Ditko, John Romita issues, if it ever you know gets up to that point. So like. This is this is a Silver Age mm -hmm. comic with all that that entails. One of the things I am curious about, uh, it doesn't look like it from the way the the art is. Um, was it drawn Marvel method? I doubt it because I feel like as an artist, you would have, you know, have a few more anchors and stuff like that if you were designing the whole thing. Could this be. seems very well structured. It is funny to see this as a uh, high school student, Peter Parker, because, man, these dudes are 35 years old. Oh, totally. <laughs> like, you know, like, like uh, you know, Al Red has skills, no doubt, man. But uh, that is a uh, near middle-aged. Uh, I don't know if we said this, but he's ask he asks uh, the Invisible Girl out, and it's to get back at Johnny Storm. Yeah, because Johnny Storm usurped him, uh, grabbing some uh, bank robbers or something, man, and, and let... Spider-Man know that he did it on purpose to just uh, coitus interrupt us, his superhero moment. Good thing. All these characters are pretty good. You know, I feel like every interpretation of All Red with all these classic characters works. I, uh, this comic was not something, it would be on the stands, but because of the price point, it would disappear really, really fast. Whenever I would see it on the stands, I would scoop it up and never felt slighted on any issues of this. Usually Pat Olaf was the guy uh, yes. doing the drawing on the regular stuff, but obviously, you know, you can't do 13 books and have a 60-pager. Look how good Betty Brandt's expression is whenever uh, Parker tells her that he has other plans for the night. Straight up Lichtenstein right here, man. It's, it's such a romance comic image. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, pop art was what would be referenced with Mike Allred's style a whole bunch, and I didn't know what that meant as a kid, but I know what it means now. It really, it really fits this story well. Yeah, Triple A Pop, his publishing, when he was self-publishing. Yeah. This is one of those, like, cute moments, like, <laughs> like Spider-Man coming to his date. He's got a web bow tie <laughs> it's so that, dumb. He, that he fastens. <laughs> and, you know, he doesn't have uh, all that money in the world. So he's, you know, she's pulling out the whip. She's pulling out the Rolls Royce, man. And she's, you know, she's not emasculating our guy. He can afford some pizza. She's like, yeah, let's do it. It's a I bet. love that she's dressed up and he's in costume. <laughs> hey, man, it was Spider-Man that brought her on the date. It feels it feels totally of that era where, you know, you can kind of get away with some of this stuff without uh, too many questions being asked. Just have fun. Just have fun, man. <laughs> 
Torch wants to get back at Spider-Man, so he starts to boil <laughs> boil the uh, the Atlantic, <laughs> and it rouses up by Namor. Right. Fantastic, right? Great color choices here, because you got that poppy red against all these cool colors. Yeah, and also, don't color your sky blue. And it's goddamn right, man. This is another one of these examples of, like, the pop kind of stuff, like, all of it. You know, just having a, a normal-looking person eating pizza with Spider-Man. So weird. Seeing these poses, these thoughtful poses that you've seen and you know it, but you've never seen it in comics. This is, uh, you know, when you talk about jobbers or whatever, you're just not emphasizing this stuff. Yeah. You know, like, that's not what you're there for. You're there to have Spider-Man swinging through buildings and punching somebody. And that's what you would get with the alternative comics is like, hey, I'm doing slice of life stuff or, you know, more rounded characters. And that's where you start to find these artists who are looking at things beyond a cool dynamic punch. And it's it's storytelling. So, you know, she's got a little little schmutz on the hand. She's cleaning it off. It's 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 giving you storytelling. That's so old school. Yeah. And there are moments that feel burns like, you know, some of the feathering on her jacket, I think, feels a little bit like that. And that's Sinnet. Yeah. You know, those sharp Sinnet lines, man. This almost doesn't feel like Mike Allred at all. You, well, hey, you wonder if some of the stuff is redrawn, touched up. Yeah. Uh, you know, let Sinnet fix some things into more of the Marvel style. We know that happens throughout Marvel and DC history, so why not? Yeah. Yeah, it just looks so different. It, I mean, it did Sin it even ink? Like, there's there's something happening with there. Yo, Mike, tell us tell us what what this is, man. Yeah, I think you're right. But again, because that's this, super. This is as good as it gets for the whole pop stuff, especially a hand of Spider Man. It's all you need to, to know Spider Man. Namor double lit in the face. Good job on the coloring there. It's wonderful storytelling here, man. Half mask pulling the thing down. You don't see that often. The cock of that head is so subtle and so perfect. I like his Spider-Man eyes. They're rounded. There's no corner for like the outside or inside of the eye, and yeah. I really like that. Yeah, it is good. I don't know who that comes from or if that's just an all redism, but it's neat. It makes it very distinct. You know, it feels like it's that 70s TV show kind of uh, mask in a way. And he'll do these things too. Like, I draw Spider-Man again. I'm putting a couple wrinkles like on all the, all the creases, all the elbows and the knees and the hips right there. Like, that is dope. I think the extreme of that is like the uh, Japanese manga Spider-Man. It's very, you know, the costume is very clearly the costume. Yeah. Uh, it can look pretty cool. It's such a wild pose right there, man. You you never would never see, like, in a dynamic Marvel piece, you would never see that fist kind of cut off with the rest of the body. You would see the, that foot come, come out. Yeah, there's a lot that's odd there. That arc of how he's throwing the fist, too, makes no sense. You know, like, it seems like it should be going this way. Right. I don't know. It's it's an odd one. So you get your classic kind of uh, misunderstanding between heroes as Spider-Man and Namor have to sort this out. And, uh, of course, it's going to be up to uh, Sue to really save the day and, and bring in the Fantastic Four and end this ridiculousness. Ridiculousness? Like, like sort of the color on there with the little radio blurs? That is just divorced from the line art that's being presented. Totally. The uh, shaded eye is something... I, I don't know if, how often that's used. No. Odd stuff. Great gesture. Great piece of body language here, man. He's just such a fantastic feels, figure drawer. Very, uh, you know, you can see the all, the all red, the madman character in that kind of pose. Great pose there. What was that? Is that that's not a Steven Seagal figure? New Captain is it? Action. Look how action, much it man. looks like Steven Seagal. Yeah, man. I bet they sell more, more units if that's uh, hard to kill. <laughs> action man. Got to get that license, man. That looks like Mike Allred. Yeah. <laughs> He's got that mirror by his drafting board, man. Just a lot of unusual panels. To me, this stuff is very not Marvel esque, and that's good. That's why you bring somebody new in. Yeah, totally. I I ate this up at the time and it felt like permission uh that you don't have to draw like your average you know house style guy house styles were still kind of mm -hmm. kind of there you know it, it was it was jim lee art was the house style at the time yeah. it's graduated from busemo wannabes to to uh to jim lee energy and anything that looked different from that is the stuff i was buying this feels like untold tales the the art style it feels very much because it's readable yeah 
That's pretty fun choice, having the stars in the eyes whenever Namor actually connects on one. Totally. Totally. Good stuff with with, uh, Jameson here complaining about, you know, keeping up his interpretation of how Spider-Man's the menace. It's such heel tactics the way he explains what happens. (laughs) He saved us, says Betty Brant. He missed us is more like it. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly what a heel would say. You got to have those moments. And there's also that, that's Kurtzman-like storytelling, too, where you have the same camera angle Mm -hmm. with two separate moments occurring. And when you have it like this, it's like one second transpires amongst these four panels right there. It's a great spread all around. That that spread just, you roll through it so easily. And this is where we realize that our heroes uh, had a misunderstanding, man, (laughs) because uh, Johnny Storm gave up the ghost when he was sitting back laughing. I enjoyed the Namor-Sue dynamic in this story, too. I think that's pretty well done. Uh, good job on Buziak for finding like how to bring these pieces that you've already got the the moments around them. So making it work within the comics history, pretty well done. And a good thing. Not a bad one. You know, Sin it. Sin it really. That's yeah, a strong you're going to have uh, Fantastic Four, man. You couldn't do better than Joe Sin it for your anchor. We got to have our... Uh, Punchline moment, man. Payback. Peter Parker has to get one over. Hey, the name of the book Spider-Man, not Johnny Storm. You gotta put your guy over, man. <laughs> and there it is. The webbing, you know, in those old uh, Steve Ditko comics, the webbing lasts an hour. You got till 1030, show the little clock, the crash. The best part, I feel like the promo that's really being cut is that Human Torch walks around in his suburban little home in his costume. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> As a Undertaker in 1996. <laughs> this is this is uh, three years after Undertaker won his first WWF championship. Yeah, you have much to say about Joey Pulaski, though. I don't. And you see, uh, Amazing Fantasy 16, 17. Right. I like this conceit. I think it's pretty fun. Gil Kane, Gil Kane piece in. of art. Pat I can't complain about that. Waringo. Yeah, this is a nice little feature, and it's in line with what annuals used to do. They would always have, like, the Ditko pinups in the back of the Spider-Man stuff. This is fun. Yeah, nod to the uh, the original Steve Ditko, Stan Lee, how they create uh, Spider-Man comics, which was huge from, you know, when I got hold of that, it was, like, awesome just to see him inking lines and stuff. Yeah, uh, from, from Spider-Man annual number exactly. one. Uh, you know, replace uh, the Kurt Busiek with, uh, with uh, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko with Pat Olive. It, it was real cool, staring real close at Pat Olive's shelves and stuff. He's got the Cowboy Wally show on his racks, man. Got that uh, that Abrams yep. <laughs> Marvel book, Will Eisner graphic novels, man. Hellboy, Milk Kniff books, Bill Sienkiewicz. Hey, let's not forget the wizard as being a thrown-in character villain. I feel like that's... It's Wizard. Like <laughs> You can't have a character named Wizard without being compared to Wizard Magazine at the time. And Pittsburgh's own Ron Friends on the pencils there. Kurt Busiek, he, he's no dummy. No. He's no dummy, man. Uh, this is great. You know, like doing the nine-panel grid, you know, keeping in line with that original version of this story. Busiek uh, sort of revered for his, his comics kind of fanboy knowledge of, of Silver Age comics. You see he has all the mar- milestone editions on the walls and stuff there, man. Uh, so he's he knows the canon. He knows all that stuff. He's read it. You know, he before Douglas Wolk's book, man, Kurt Busiek was the guy who read all the all the old Marvel stuff. Uh, so the idea is he's coming up with stories where he's tying in such tangential, you know, Pace Pot Pete type characters that showed up one, two times. And now poor Pat Olaf has to, like, find reference for that stuff. <laughs> uh, reprints were not ubiquitous. You know, you'd have to drop $50, $60 for those Marvel milestones if... Marvel decided to reprint these particular things, so he has to go to a shop and actually fork down hard-earned money for Tales of to Astonish number 49. Good thing that uh, he can write this stuff off on his taxes. Yeah, Love man. that that's part of it. <laughs> yeah, listen, man. One of the perks of the comic book life. Name of the game. And uh, just when he's lining up all the references he needs to make his comic, you know, he's doing up some devil dinosaur sketches to try to figure out, get a, get a handle on that character. Guess what happens, man? Kurt Busiek calls him one more time. He's like, yo, scrap that idea. I got a better one. 
Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun for a little uh, three pager, and again, homage to that original Ditko classic. Pat Olaf is dope, man. I liked him too. Real real solid artist. And he does this little piece, man, giving you a guided tour of uh, Spidey's world. Not a bad package. The perspective on this is real crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's a big stove. <laughs> <laughs> and and just how far down our guys are. Not a bad package to get for the price of two dollars when this came out. I was there. I watched it, man. John Romita Sr., John Romita Jr. was on as well. You could see, man. I think my dad spilled some coffee on the <laughs> coffee table or something. Uh, That's going to hurt your resale value, Ed. John CGC is not going to like that coffee stain. <laughs> John Sr., schooling John Romita Jr., <laughs> saying he drew too many lines in Gwen Stacy's hair when they were with the Sharpie markers on the big bulletin board thing. Put too many lines in Gwen Stacy's hair. Son, she's a blonde. Get some of those lines out of there. <laughs> Good luck I, removing your Sharpie. I actually bought something from, from the QVC there, too. What it was, was it? It was it was a Spider-Man. Like, what they did was they just, like, hot glued a bunch of issues into, like, a uh, uh, soft cover that Steve Lytle drew that was just a silhouette. It was, like, the cheapest thing ever, and they just took random issues and glued them into this spine, and it was, like, 15 bucks or something. Man, early days of trade paperbacks. It was, but it was it was QVC exclusive. Right, that was the whole gimmick, man. <laughs> I had to try. I had to get something. Mom and dad called up. Had to give the credit card. It was a big deal, man. It's probably the cheapest item they were selling. Fifteen bucks. Yeah, because it was all. You know what they were selling a lot of? Uh, uh, printer plates, like like lead printer plates of like you know the seventies, eighties comics. And what stuff. a weird item. But I, I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, they but, are they are interesting to see those things, but. I, I never hardly see those kind of things like float around for sale. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe the guys that bought those, maybe it's a good investment. Hanging on to them. <laughs> K favors. Like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rug, where you can download out of print zines and mini comics. About a dozen of those available right now. The latest, the BW zine, collecting, uh, collaging some 80s black and white indie comics. You can also see my original art uh, process, how I make the comics I make, like Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, Plain Janes, Octobriana, and more. That is patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Red Room, the anti-social network, trade paperback book collection hit in the stands November 9th. Uh, get it at your local comic shop. Order it directly from Fantagraphics or go to amazon.com. Scoop up uh, the anti-social network trade paperback, man. 70 so pages of extra material to create a completely different experience than just reading those issues that came out. Speaking of issues, the, tr the Trigger Warnings uh, miniseries of Red Room Comics is going to begin coming out in December. You can pre-order those at the Fantagraphics website, and you can read those comics on my Patreon. Uh, all those links are in my link tree in the description below this video. What else, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below the video. Given those Martian orders, man, we're going to be on our way. Read more comics.